we realized this, that he kind of saw me as um, the person that would carry forward his intellectual theories into the next generation. I think that he felt that way about me, and he often, I often have people say that to me, that he would say, if you want to find out more about it, see Ruth, or talk to Ruth about it. What I want to tell you is that in my life, my, when I took on and learned about John's ideas um, and began to build my own life, he always used to say that one great tree can't grow under another great tree. And he encouraged me to go off and make my own life, and that's what I did. Um, I came out from under that tree and tried to build my own tree. And my own tree was in the area of genetics. The questions that he brought up and the ideas that he had took another form in me, another interest in me. And the interest was looking at it from the inside out. What do we know about genetics that we can then connect with John's ideas? What is it about looking at it from a human, sort of evolutionary point of view and understanding, seeing the universe that way instead of thinking it from the big side out. And John was very interested in doing this, but never pursued it, because he had no training in that area. When I start my classes at Sacramento State in genetics, and I've been there 15, 15 years now teaching, the first thing I ask my students is, what makes living things different from non-living things? And we have a debate kind of at the beginning, like John used to have. We have a, an idea session, where we brainstorm. And I've done this for a long time. And in the end, it always comes down to three things. Someone mentioned earlier, John had three things that things came down to. He talked about the infinite, um, the undivided, and the unchanging. And that being then embodied in the universe as a, a universe that was changing and divided and not infinite. And so, in essence, this is true also in biology, is really it comes down to three things that separate living things from non-living things. The first thing is that we have an information molecule, and that's DNA. And DNA is a digital information molecule. It carries information in a digital format of A, G, C, and T. And this is what's handed down. And digital information, the reason that we, we use digital information now, um, as a way of transmitting, is it's a much better way of transmitting than analog. It's much more faithful. And so over time, what's happened is that organisms have evolved um, to build survival machines that perpetuate themselves. That's what living things do. And this was a type of perspective that John really enjoyed. He liked these big picture ideas. The second thing that separates living things from non-living things is the ability to separate self from other. You can't evolve and think of yourself as something different, as being alive, unless you've separated yourself from those things that are non-living. And organisms do that with a, a membrane, uh, which we call the cell, but it's surrounded by a very thin layer of oil, essentially. And within that context, within the cell, the DNA can then evolve and create survival machines that look different than other survival machines. And one that can even uh, has evolved to the point that it can actually understand that it's a survival machine and then also have ideas like John had. And then the third thing that living organisms do is that we have to direct a stream of negative entropy upon our bodies. And the reason we have to do that is because we're very complex. And as John always used to say, the universe is going towards entropy. It's going the other direction from complexity. And the only way that you can build complexity in the universe is to direct a stream of negative entropy on yourself. And that's the reason that we have to harvest energy either directly from the sun, as photosynthesis and organisms do, or indirectly by eating those same organisms, or organisms that eat them. So these ideas going forward, I'm not his only intellectual child, Many of us are his intellectual children. But his ideas have gone forward in other ways and morphed and become different things and are carried on in other generations. And I've had countless students now, I don't know, hundreds of students go through my genetics courses where we've talked about ideas that, that John was very interested in, but then are the next generation of sort of the ideas that he, that he worked with. 
But his big picture thinking and his way of looking at the world is what attracted to me. It sounds like many people in this room, it was the same thing. These big picture ideas were what drew us to him. And it was the same for me. And I feel very, very fortunate to have been a part of his life, to have carried on his intellectual legacy in the ways that I have. And I'm just so moved that everyone here um, has, has come to, to celebrate his life because he lived such an incredibly wonderful life. Also have a few things I just want to say, and there are funny stories about John um, that I remember. Um, he loved the Rockford Files. Uh, he, he thought the Rockford Files was just great. That was the TV show. Um, he loved Star Trek. He loved, loved Star Trek. And he watched those old episodes, the ones from the first, the first season. He just loved the first season of Star Trek. Um, he, didn't, he had a, a, a lot of dietary uh, interests, and so he, he had restrictions on what he would eat. And he had this thing called blah that he would make. Um, he thought that if he ate blah in the morning, and of course all everybody else ate blah around him, that we didn't have to eat anything else for the rest of the day. We could, but we wouldn't have to. And this consisted of bran, wheat bran, and uh, molasses, and brewer's yeast, and, and wheat germ. I mean, it was just dreadful. And we would all sit around and eat this stuff um, in the morning. Um, and then we wouldn't have anything for the rest of the day. We didn't want to. Um, but he had these sort of dietary. So I remember the day that Lauren was born. I was at the hospital. And, uh, and uh, he disappeared. He disappeared. He went off. And I was like kind of panicked, you know. Um, he's left. And I'm going to have this baby. And, and uh, he had gone home to get wheat germ. <laughs> because he wanted to make sure that I was getting all my vitamin E and nutrients and stuff like that. And he almost missed Lauren's birth because he was off getting wheat germ uh, at the house. So that's another kind of story about him. Um, he also loved to, I remember when he was about six years old, he was running up Mount Tam. And I was much younger, um, you can probably all tell that. And, uh, and I, I thought, my God, you know, he was so much more fit than I was, and I was so much younger than he was. Um, but he used to run up Tam um, when he was in his 60s. And uh, he, he, uh, he used to uh, bring a shirt with him, and he, he bat away the horse flies, and he loved to sunbathe out there. And he just, that was sort of a, a great second home for him was Mount Tamalpais. And he spent a lot of his life up there on Mount Tam hiking. And then he and I hiked and hiked and hiked miles and miles, sometimes 15, 20 miles a day. I think Lauren hiked, what was it, 23 miles? 26 miles when he was, when he was uh, two or three, two years old. Um, because nobody had, told, nobody had told us that you couldn't do that. So as John, very unconventionally, you know, you could just do whatever. So, you know, we did those kinds of things. But we talked about ideas the whole time. And it was such a wonderful period. I, I just don't even know how, how to say what a wonderful time it was to be around an intellect like that and somebody who thought that way and was so exciting intellectually. And it stayed with me my whole life. I had told Bill that I didn't think I would talk because I'm a very emotional person and I tend to break down and cry um, at events like this. But I actually am holding it together. And I think one of the reasons is because he was 98. And you, know, you just can't be too sad when somebody's lived that kind of life. As, as much as a loss it is, it was such a wonderful life and it was such a long life that we have so much to be grateful for. And you just have to feel very celebratory today. Thank you. Thank you. If you have a question, I have a question. And thank you for what you said. It's so wonderful to have you and Lauren here. My name is Indira. Can you tell us something about John's mother or the women in his family? Thank you. Well, I don't know a whole about, a lot, a lot about um, that. I can say that, for those of you that don't know any of John's heritage, John was born in China. Um, his father was a zoologist who <coughs> moved to China to teach zoology at Peking University. Um, John's mother was the daughter of the founder of Peking University, and he was the president of Peking University at that time. Um, she, was, she was the president's daughter that the incoming zoologist fell in love with. And, um, and they lived in China until John was about 12 or 13 years old. Um, he had three brothers. He had an older brother, Ernest, who was a, a physician. Um, he had a um, 
younger, two younger brothers. One was Robert Lowry, who also became a physician, and then he had a younger brother, Harrison. Um, after John left the monastery, um, Harrison was very, very kind to him, and they spent quite a bit of time together. I spent quite a bit of time with Harrison and his wife, Eleanor. Um, they left uh, Lauren a college fund, um, which he... Uh, Squandered. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually a straight-A student, so I can... But, um, <laughs> unlike John, by the way, John, I came across John's college transcripts the other day as I was going through some of his things, and I was looking at the C and D grades um, in college, and I was kind of like, wow, you know, <laughs> I'd be advising my students maybe not to, not to continue with their education if they were coming to me for advising, so I'd say... But, um, but, you know, he was very uh, unconventional, so that, I guess that's not too surprising. But um, uh, he loved his mother. He, um, uh, he had a lot of photos of his mother. As I've gone through his things, he has many, many photos of her, different times in her life, um, which, are, which are wonderful. And, um, and he uh, had a lot of respect for her. He also left the monastery to uh, be with his father when father died. I don't mean permanently left, but he... He went home for his father's death, and he said that when his father died, uh, he held his hand and he read from um, Ram Krishna's works as his father was dying, um, and that he saw light in his father's eyes, um, that he, he felt like it was, it was something that meant a lot to his father um, when, when his father was dying. Um, so John was a very sweet person, um, at, at a family level, a personal level, he was a very, very sweet person. And um, like I said, I just feel so fortunate to have been to have been a woman in his life, <laughs> and you've had that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. something that was sent uh, to me uh, last night by uh, Patrick Horn and uh, uh, Eliza, <clears throat> who uh, came relatively late. As John had given his classes so many times here, uh, many of us had been to them dozens of times, and uh, it, there weren't that many new people coming around that uh, wanted to hear these things. And so. It, uh, it was wonderful when someone like Patrick and Eliza would show up. They would, were so interested, and they would, uh, in John's older years, when he really wasn't able, that able to give classes anymore, they would sit with him and, and chat for a long time. So <clears throat> they're in New York, and we're very sorry that they couldn't be here today, and that uh, because John had had such an important influence in his life, in their lives. Uh, he says that John helped me bridge the final gap between my questions of the physics and the metaphysics of existence, and I am grateful for the hours and days he spoke to me at length and answered my questions. Uh, I remember that he called me for follow-up interviews for the Sidewalk Astronomer's film and asked that I sit with, uh, next to him during it. And I came over in the rain and was soaked, but I was glad, I know he was glad to have someone to talk to that needed to know this information. His cosmology may be controversial, but it is correct. He had nice compliments for my intelligence, and uh, uh, he was very appreciative that uh, uh, he had come there and was in the right place. And for Eliza, uh, the, the two of them had a special bond, and uh, he would always wait for what he called the little one. He would call her the little one, and which is now her lifelong nickname. Uh, at the lunch table on Sundays, and as soon as they saw her, he said, oh, there you are, I wanted to tell you something. And then for the next two or three hours, they would be chatting and have this long, private conversation with smiles on their faces. Uh, the sight of them in deep communion was a delight to everyone around them at the lunch table. So he also uh, put something on YouTube, but it has this very odd link, I'm not quite sure how to tell you what this is, maybe I can send it to Don and you can send it to around the people. Uh, I haven't even had a chance to look at it myself since it just came last night. Uh, are we ready for the... Uh, not quite yet. All right. <laughs> there was a... Uh, what that? <laughs> okay. uh, another person that was uh, very uh, instrumental in, in John's life was Mudra, who of course passed away many years ago. She. 
but she was one of the very interesting people who again just seemed to have an instant uh, bond. She had heard him talk at a yoga group and uh, was fascinated and, and went and insisted on going over to see him. And when she went to see him, uh, he had a picture of Holy Mother there. And apparently she had a dream. Can we make these two seats available for Lauren and Ruth here so that we can sure. see this video? Yeah, we got a couple of extra seats here. Um, and apparently she had had a dream or a vision of Holy Mother and was, uh, didn't know who it was. And, uh, and so when she saw this picture of Holy Mother in John's room, she just kind of went sort of... <laughs> so uh, she spent many years with John, but unfortunately she got uh, cancer and John ended up taking care of her and pretty much uh, went bankrupt trying to, to take care of her. But uh, she was a, a very important person and did a lot for uh, setting John up for uh, talking to other groups and so forth. So, how are we doing now? Uh, this was put together by Leah Early, who's been an intern here with our archive department. She's done an absolutely wonderful job. So, please enjoy the video. Hey, Bob, how are Not there the sun shines, nor moon, nor star. There the lightning does not fly out of this light. Black shining, after shining, all of this. By its light, all this is made. Absolute, seen through the 
screen of time, space, and causation. who looked through that telescope, wanted to make telescopes of their own. And I thought, oh Lord, if I help those kids make telescopes, I'm sure to get thrown out of this monastery. <laughs> there was a little boy in San Francisco, who made a telescope with me. That's a 12 inch telescope, about seven and a half feet long. And that's a bigger telescope than anybody in the San Francisco amateur astronomers have. Their biggest was a nine inch, any of the 12 inch. And um, he's taken the astronomy class at the Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, twice already. And he's five years too young to join their club. He's nine years old, they won't let him in until he's 14. He's five years too young to join the club. Has a bigger telescope than any of them. And he's nine years old. So, uh, I invited another boy to go over to his house and so we could talk. And they decided we should have a club. So that was the side of astronomers. First year there were three, second year there were 13, third year there were 30, the fourth year there were 60, I think now there are 250. Uh, I wanted a copy of a little book, The Altar Flowers, that we had some Sanskrit things that I used to sing. And so I went over to the Berkeley Center. I lived in San Francisco. Went over to the Berkeley Center and met Swami Swahananda, and it was not a meeting night or anything. And I asked him if I could get a copy of Altar Flowers. Oh, he said, Brother well, devotees has died, and there are all those books out there in the foyer. Go take what you want. So I took a whole box of books, and I wanted to pay him for some for them. Oh no, he's not going to take any money. <laughs> but I insisted. <coughs> I'm going to give him twenty dollars, so he agreed he could take twenty dollars. So the only piece of money I had was a fifty dollar bill. Well, guess what the likelihood of check 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 of cashing a fifty dollar bill in the house? Not the likelihood. Of it. Anyway. So he said, I'm going to twist your arm. He said, I'm going to keep the other $30 and make you a member of the Berkeley Center. So that's how it felt. 